you remember the magazine highlights for children? Of course I do, she said. I remember how I hated going to the doctor when I was a kid until I started reading highlights in the waiting room. Turn right at this intersection, I said, and Trader Joe's will be on the left in a block. Do you have Trader Joe's in Canada? No. Okay, so Trader Joe's is a restaurant, uh, sorry, it's a, it's a small specialty market that we have uh, in a few cities in America. It started in Southern California, so it's one of those things that I just took for granted, but it's a really big deal everywhere else. When they finally opened one in New York, the line to get into Trader Joe's was like two hours and stretched around a couple of blocks. It was a line to get into a grocery store. <laughs> uh, but it's a wonderful restaurant. They've got all kinds of really great, sorry, I keep saying restaurant and I mean uh, uh, market. It's a wonderful market. They have all kinds of uh, uh, like really carefully sourced food. They've got a really great wine selection. They have a lot of really great prepared foods. There's a great cookbook called Cooking with All Things Trader Joe's where you treat Trader Joe's like it's your prep kitchen. I love it. Here's the thing about Trader Joe's. The person who decides where Trader Joe's is going to go goes around to all sorts of places. He finds real estate in great locations with great, usually historic buildings. But then if the parking lot is bigger than three cars, says, no, we're not going to Trader Joe's. <laughs> um, so anyway, that's what Trader Joe's is. This is where we were going on our way home after dinner. Uh, I said, turn right at this intersection and Trader Joe's will be on the left in a block. She turned right and I realized that Trader Joe's was actually to the left. Oh, my bad. It's actually back to the left. As we drove under the freeway to a place where we could make a U-turn, I said, did anyone ever read highlights in some place that wasn't a doctor's or dentist's office? The library at my school had a subscription, and said, so we read it there. We got to the next intersection, which featured a nice big no U-turn sign. Well, this quick stop at Trader Joe's is turning into quite an adventure, I said, as we waited for the red light. We were quiet for a second, and I said, you know, I've been seeing highlights in someone's house. Would have been like seeing your teacher in the grocery store, you know? Like, it's familiar, but out of context and makes you uncomfortable, so you make eye contact with your shoes the entire time and hope to just get out of there. Because somehow you're gonna end up with homework because you ran into your teacher in real life. The light turned green and we made a left onto a dark industrial street. You know what I always hated about highlights, Anne said? Some idiot kid had always circled the hidden pictures. <laughs> oh, seriously, I said. Fuck that kid, man. <laughs> the kid's a dick. <laughs> and what kind of parent gives their kid a pen to draw over a magazine that's obviously intended for more than one kid to read? Asshole parents, I said. <laughs> it's called Highlights for Children, shirk. Not Highlights for Your Children. Because doctor's offices don't exactly have pins lying around everywhere, she said. There's one, and it's attached by a string to a clipboard. <laughs> I lost my place. <laughs> oh, about timing, we <laughs> There it is. Yeah, some mom had to go into her purse, dig around that used Kleenex and that giant weird kind of checkbook wallet thing that moms carry, and find the pen. We turned back toward Ray Trader Joe's and I raised my hands over my head as we went through the freeway underpass. Whee! <laughs> Put my hands back in my lap. I mean, that's a lot of time for her to think, hey, maybe I shouldn't be giving little Johnny Snotface this pen to ruin the magazine for all the other children. We turned into the tiny Trader Joe's parking lot and parked the car. As we got out and walked in, I said, you know, Highlights should have done a goofus and gallant about that. You've spent a lot of time thinking about this. It's what I do. Thank you. Uh, 
uh, it took us a little while to find ourselves, to find our voice, to figure out like, what the show was about. And um, I wrote these like episode recaps of the first half of the first season uh, that are sort of like looking back at Star Trek The Next Generation the way that you would look through a high school yearbook. Um, uh, like if you're looking through the yearbook, you, like, you would say things like this. Oh, I remember him, I love that guy. What was her name? <gasps> remember when we went to this place and that thing happened there? And, oh my God, I can't believe I thought that was cool. I'm such a nerd. <laughs> like like those, those things, you know, like, boy, am I glad those pants never came back. Like those are, like, those are things you'd say when you're looking through a, uh, a yearbook, right? Well, for me, um, Star Trek, uh, The Next Generation was my high school. I started when I was 14, I finished when I was 19. And uh, it, looking at it, looking back at it again, is very much like uh, looking back through this yearbook. So I wrote this book, and it's uh, uh, sort of uh, humorous uh, recaps of the episodes, followed with uh, a, a little bit of uh, like insights about uh, uh, like what I remember from production, some behind the scenes memories, some quotable dialogue, for example, nice planet. And uh, uh, the, uh, the sort of the bottom line is sort of take the long view and sort of analyze Star Trek uh, in the context of the larger arc of the first season. Uh, and then I give each episode a letter grade. <laughs> Even grading on a curve. Um, it, uh, it wasn't always easy. So um, I, uh, I want to read you a little bit from uh, Justice. Um, Justice is one of my favorite bad episodes. <laughs> And, uh, uh, I'm just going to uh, read you a little bit of the synopsis, and I'm going to put my clock out here so that I don't, I don't want to take up, I, I don't want to sit here and just talk about the things I'm interested in, I also want to take your questions. So, this is called Justice. Um, uh, oh, extraordinarily important bit of context that I always seem to forget to, to leave out here. Um, I love Star Trek. I'm super proud of Star Trek. I was a huge Star Trek fan before I started working on Star Trek. I was a fan the entire time I worked on it. Um, I was not a fan for a while, which is just a consequence of being a late teenager and trying to figure out who I was. And then around my mid-twenties, um, I sort of had this experience at the appropriately named Star Trek, the experience in Las Vegas, <laughs> uh, that kind of like, that kind of like re reminded me everything I loved about Star Trek. And it helped me kind of get past the stuff that I didn't like about Star Trek. All this is, is uh, uh, told in the story, The uh, Saga of SpongeBob Vegas Pants. Um, <laughs> which, by the way, kids, is a good reason that you should uh, put some thought into the titles of your stories. Because you might be calling something The Saga of SpongeBob Vegas Pants ten years later. Uh, and it's in my book, uh, Dancing Barefoot, and then it's also excerpted in Just a Geek. Uh, so that's very important context. I am not here to just sort of like whiz all over Star Trek, because I genuinely love it. Um, but, like, sometimes you have to look back on things and, and laugh, and that's what I'm doing with this. Justice, originally aired November 9th, 1987. Ah, my bursitis! <laughs> uh, directed by James Conway, Stardate 41255.6, synopsis. After dropping off some human colonists in the Sternod solar system, the Enterprise notices a rather nice Class M planet in the nearby Rubicon system. It's called Rubicon 3. Picard sends an away team down to the surface to find out if it's a good place for some shore leave. And they return with some very good news. It's clean, it's beautiful, it's populated by friendly humanoids, and they really like to do it. <laughs> At the drop of a hat, according to Jordy. Any hat, Tasha adds knowingly. Picard sends a second large away, larger away team down to the planet to see exactly how many hats they're going to need. <laughs> because every responsible Starfleet parent would want to send their children down to the galaxy's longest running planetary orgy, he orders Wesley Crusher to go down. See the planet is a good place for kids to hang out. <laughs> Leading down to the planet, the away team quickly learns three important facts. Fact number one, the planet's inhabitants are called the Edo. They like to jog everywhere. Fact number two, they are all beautiful blonde models, possibly descended from some sort of Maxim FHM breeding program in the second century. Fact number three, the entire planet is clothed in six yards of fabric. The 
Edo's leaders jog up to meet the away team, greeting them in the traditional Edo manner, lingering glances and inappropriately long hugs. <laughs> Troy says, I'm sensing a lot of boners coming out. <laughs> Before the Edo leaders will tell Riker how many people they can bring down from the Enterprise, they suggest they play at love. Rivon, the female leader, suggests that Worf play with her, while Leator, the male leader, looks at Riker, jams his true desires deep into the closet, and asks Troy if she'll play with him. <laughs> Just before sexual harassment panda shows up, Lucy Crusher goes, dudes, this is bullshit. Either hook me up with some fine Edo ass, or get me away from you creepy middle-aged swingers so I can find it on my own. <laughs> Now that might not be actually what Wesley Crusher said, but I ran into the actor who played him at a convention and he told me that's what he was thinking at the time. <laughs> what Wesley actually says is, um, um. I'm kind of a weenie, <laughs> and I can't be so close to all these crazy hot women who want to be like all Mrs. Robinson on me. <laughs> Could you take me to some kids my own age, because boobs are scary? <laughs> I want to work on a science project and do techno babble. I really need to get back into my comfort zone, or at least change into some looser fitting pants. <laughs> Raymond and Leotor think they should run to the council chamber where they can get rid of the kid and head inside for a sexy party. But when they arrive, Raymond gives Riker the traditional Edo, hey, you totally ran a thousand meters, sensual hug and reach around. <laughs> the teenage, two, three teenagers show up, two guys and a girl. Leotor points to Wesley and tells them that he's brought them a new friend to play with. One of the guys is so excited to play with Wesley, he literally bursts into flames. <laughs> Wesley and his new pals skip away together. The away team goes inside the council chamber, where the Edo dance performed profoundly disturbing sexual, I mean sensual massage, and show off really bad late 80s hairstyles. Back on the Enterprise, the bridge crew is busy dealing with a mysterious thing that they can see, that they can't see, that's sitting off the starboard bow. Now, unfamiliar with the firm Star Trek, and the crew doesn't know that whenever anything is on the starboard bow, it's bad and should be taken seriously. <laughs> so they just assume it's some sort of sensor malfunction. If you totaled up all the times the Enterprise has a sensor malfunction, but it turns out to actually be like the giant screaming death monster just outside, who, you, the captain would be fired. <laughs> The, the ship would never be, it would be in the shop all the time. Be like, would you fix the fucking sensors, please? There's a really bad thing happening out there. Are you sure? I don't know, it's just what the sensors say. What do the sensors really do, anyway? Well, they sort of sense things that are outside the ship. Oh, really? I'm the captain, I think I know what the sensors do. Carry on. Go to warp speed and separate the saucer section. That seems to fix things. <laughs> After Data addresses this mysterious object that's sitting out there, it reveals that it's actually just a harmless erector set. <laughs> the card orders Jordy to stick his head out the window and tell him what his visor picks up. <laughs> Pylons. I'm 
Data also doesn't know what it is, but Druid reports after complete spectral analysis as if it's, that it's, it's a thing, but it's not really there, like the script to The Last Outpost. <laughs> because it sends out the universal symbol of I'm serious about messing with you, a ball of white light, which penetrates the Enterprise, cuts off all contact with the away team, and demands that Picard explain why the Enterprise is orbiting Rubicon 3. Of course, Picard then spends 10 fucking pages explaining why humans are trying to colonize the galaxy, why it's important, and how easy it is to take up some time in the script by talking in a big old circle about nothing. Here's what Picard should have said. We are going down to the planet of Humpy Orgy Times. <laughs> Do you have anything to add? No, oh, that's it. <laughs> All right. Very fun. This irritates the ball of light as much as it irritates the audience, and it shows its displeasure by whacking Data in the head and pinning him unconscious to the ground. This is a theme in a lot of the early TNG episodes. Picard's speeches get someone else tossed around. <laughs> And I don't know, like, but if, if I were a pissed off alien trying to get the bald guy to shut up, I just might throw him to the ground instead of a robot. <laughs> Down on the planet, Wesley's jogging around with his new friends. Unlike the adults who are busy getting their freak on in Plato's retreat, these kids are busy showing off their gymnastics skill. Because that's a thing you do on Edo. <laughs> I'm going to go out for a jog with him. Oh, are you going to show him back handspring? I'm not that kind of girl. <laughs> One of the Edo boys walks on his hands. Ooh, Wesley, you got served! Wesley serves back with some cartwheels and a round off. It's odd. <laughs> it's so odd that the girl get it's so odd that the girl gets so hot for Wesley that she asks him if he'll teach her how to play ball. Oh, you bet, baby. Uncle Wesley will teach you how to play ball. <laughs> Just slip into this latex bodysuit, put on a black wig, we'll play all sorts of ball, you dirty bitch. <laughs> That's weird, I don't remember writing that. <laughs> I must have an uncorrected proof or something. <laughs> Wesley tells them to get a bat. When they don't know what a bat is, he describes Worf's penis. <laughs> While the kids run off to play ball, Riker wanders around the council chambers, past a lot of Edo who are dropping a lot of hats. And seriously, Edo, if I could just talk to you for a minute, we can smell the astroglide all the way from Earth, guys. If you keep this up, we're relocating you to a planet in the Cinemax Nebula. After a conversation with Worf about Klingon sex that unfortunately forced a lot of fan fiction to be taken out of canon, Riker tries to check people and he finds out that his communicator isn't working. He gets the away team all together in one place just in case something weird is going on. When Worf goes to get Tasha, he learns that the Edo spend all their time running around and fucking because they have some rather interesting laws on the planet. Break some arbitrary rule in an arbitrary place and you die. <laughs> Kinda sucks. <laughs> but planet full of free sex! <laughs> Meanwhile, in a development nobody's not coming, Wesley breaks the law. <laughs> One of the cops asks Wesley if he freely admits to the heinous crime of falling on new plans. <laughs> Wesley stands up straight and declares, I'm with Starfleet, we don't lie. <laughs> oh, Wesley. You may be able to save the ship, but you cannot save this bad dialogue. <laughs> Riker apologizes for the mess. Wesley apologizes for playing ball. None of the writers apologize for the dialogue. <laughs> Tasha shows up just a little too late to warn them about the laws. After a quick kangaroo court, the mediators get ready to deliver some justice Edo style. Celebratory riots break out all across America while people get ready to set cars on fire in celebration of Wesley Crusher being executed. <laughs> Locks them and saves Wesley from certain death. I'm going to skip ahead a little bit uh, because uh, I'm running out of time. Um, so, uh, 
Up on the bridge, the glowing ball of light hops off data and communication with the A-team is restored. The A-team? <laughs> I apparently just put B-A and face on the planet. Which is hilarious, because there was plenty of B-A and face on that. Picard beams down, meets the away team, finds out that Wesley's been left in the Edo's custody and has a long talk with the Edo about law, justice, and the death penalty, and other hot-button topics that would probably be very inspiring and thought-provoking if they weren't delivered to a group of half-naked sex fiends who get really petulant when they don't get their way. <laughs> Apparently having to talk about tough issues instead of banging the person closest to them really grinds their gears. <laughs> so then they, get, then they start talking about God. That's awesome. I'm just going to skip that part because it's really ridiculous. Except for the part where Picard takes Rivon, the female leader, up to his uh, quarters um, so that she can look out the window and see God. This is an awesome homage to the original series because every time Captain Kirk brought a girl back to his quarters, he showed her God too. <laughs> Volume 2 is in the works. It should be out hopefully by the end of the year. Um, so it looks like I have about 20 minutes to take questions from you, the assembled audience. Uh, my understanding is that there's a microphone here. I've found in the past that the way this works best is if you line up roughly four at a time. Otherwise, it just blocks the view of the audience, which is a bummer. Um, so, uh, uh, yes, you, sir, there closest to the mic. Go first. Yeah. Will Wheaton, you are... I love your work on Big Bang Theory. Oh, thank you. So I was still a very low level uh, character at that point. So